to Junction Online. We love that God is continuing to work even through the internet. Today, we're gonna to continue our Blueprint series talking about the third beatitude. But before we get started with that, let's worship together. The earth cannot contain its joy So mountains were born Mountains were born The sea cannot contain its praise The mighty waves roar things coming up here at Junction that you might want to know about. First of all, we want to thank you guys so much. Next week is our blood drive and we have filled every spot. What a cool opportunity that we have to serve our community. So we want to say thank you again. Usually this time of year we're thinking about Sunday school promotions. That's when you as a JC kid or a JC youth get to move up a level in Sunday school. We haven't had Sunday school since March, so we want to stay in prayer for our area schools because when they go back to in-person teaching, we're going to follow suit and open Sunday school back up. So please stay in prayer for that. This time of year, we also start thinking about our fall traditions. One of those being the Holy Ghost Marshmallow Roast. That's our trunk or treat event that we're working really hard to keep a socially distanced environment so that we can keep everyone safe and still have that event here on campus. So if you want to stay up to date with all of the Junction events and announcements, you can text the word Junction to 94090 and stay in the loop. Welcome to church. We're excited you've joined us and we're going to continue in our sermon series called 
blueprints. And we're studying to be attitudes because they are the blueprints for the believer in building Christian character and starting our discipleship and our walk with Jesus. Now, just to recap you, we're going to be over in Matthew chapter 5, and this is the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, here we are is with Jesus. These are the, the red letters of the Bible, if you will so say. And Jesus is here. He's outside of Capernaum, uh, the city of Capernaum. He is on a hillside. Uh, he is uh, on an area that's serving as a natural amphitheater. The multitudes are there. And Jesus began just out, just laying out his, uh, his ministry, uh, the theology, and he is shattering some preconceived notions such as, you know, self-righteousness and uh, Zionism and, and political uh, divide. And I mean, he is really going into this and it is a pretty amazing approach. So I want to begin reading with you. In Matthew chapter 5 and, and starting in verse 1 as we get to our beatitude today. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And God, we thank you that we have an opportunity, Lord, to explore the words that you've spoken to our hearts today. And God, today that we might understand, Lord, the, the joy in serving you. And Lord, how to be blessed in this process. And God, today we ask any of those out there that, Lord, are suffering or, or need you, that, Lord, today be the day they open their hearts and receive the gospel, receive salvation and redemption that only you can provide. So God, we ask you to be with us today. Allow everything, everything said and everything done be for your glory and your honor. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now the word blessed uh, goes beyond just happy. It has the implication of blessed is meaning that you have everything that you need spiritually wise, meaning you are blessed, you are self-efficient. Now what this really means too also is, is being blessed deals with our Christian character. And character is what's true about you, not just what others think about you, that's reputation, but character is what is true about you, what you know in your heart, because you may be able to deceive everyone else, but you never deceive God, and you probably aren't deceiving your own self either. But also, happiness isn't something you find. You know, happiness is something that you uh, discover on your way to seeking righteousness and seeking to serve God. And what we look at here is not what blessed men do, not what blessed men have, but what blessed men are. And they are blessed. And I want to explore this with you in thinking about this one today that we're pondering on meekness. Meekness, some people would say, well, that's not a blessing at all because they associate meekness with weakness or they associate meekness with not being strong. And today we wouldn't say blessed are the meek. They're probably saying blessed are the, the strong men. Uh, blessed are those that are powerful. Blessed are those that have mental capability. Blessed are those that, that have talents and gifts and, and can achieve greatness. But that isn't what the Bible says at all. It doesn't say blessed are the people that have financial wealth or ability, power, connections, prominence, position, power. No, it doesn't. It says blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So what is meekness? Meekness is definitely not weakness. And when we look at the word meekness, I, I, I want you to understand when we think of this, and, and you may still associate in your mind with weakness, I want to remind you that Jesus was meek. And do you call Jesus weak? I mean, Jesus was a, a man. I mean, he was biblically a man. Jesus was in no way weak. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, I couldn't do that. I don't know anybody else that could probably do that. I mean, that took a tremendous amount of just physical and mental and emotional ability to fast 40 days and 40 nights. I'd like to see any of our bodybuilders or weightlifters that might be listening try that. And then after he fasted the 40 days and 40 nights, he, he went then and was tempted. Uh, and tempted even, you know, he's, he, the devil came to him and said, if you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Could you imagine the temptation? I mean, he, not eating or for 40 days and 40 nights. He could, he could probably smell the bread. He could probably taste the bread. But Jesus knew that man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. But also, Jesus didn't just 
fast 40 days and 40 nights. One of my, one of the passages that just strikes me so much in the Bible is it says, and Jesus made a whip. And he used that to go rent out the money changers. And, and I wonder sometimes, how long does it take you to make a whip? What was he thinking? As he sit there and he's making this leather whip, and he goes, and I mean, he physically runs out people that are, that are money changers. I mean, he goes out and clears out the temple of physical people. And a weak person isn't able to do that. Only a strong person is able to do that. And then Jesus says this too, and he says, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was a man of strength. And I know sometimes we see these pictures of him and it looks like he just stepped out of the beauty parlor. Uh, I, I don't think that's the image of Jesus. You know, Jesus was someone of, of Mediterranean descent, uh, meaning he, he would have had olive-colored skin, darker toned. Uh, he, he would have been a, 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 a definitely a man's man, not somebody w with hair that looked like he just came out of a salon. He would have been someone who would have, have exemplified strength. But what else? The Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. But who else in the Bible was somebody that described as meek? I mean, Jesus awfully is, the, uh, is obviously the exemplary person to observe in the New Testament. What about if we go back to the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, the person who was described as being the meekest in all of the Old Testament was that of Moses. And Moses was definitely not a weak person. Moses was one that that first 40 years of his life he spent it in the Pharaoh's palace was educated in all the ways of the Egyptians. But the next 40 years of his life, Moses spent it out in the wilderness, in the desert, uh, herding sheep and doing that. And you could imagine he would have faced wildlife. He would have faced beasts. He would have faced robbers. He would have faced everything in the world, the elements. But yet Moses persevered. That is not weakness. The last 40 years of Moses' life, remember when he did, he confronted the Pharaoh himself. And not only did he confront the Pharaoh, but he led the children of Israel out of Egypt onto the exodus, into the wilderness, on the way to the promised land. In doing this, he fought enemy after enemy. And Moses was the great general that led the Israelite army. That sure doesn't sound like weakness to me. Matter of fact, that sounds like strength. So I hope that we can understand that when we come to the definition of meekness, it is not one of weakness. Yet that's why when we have horses and we break them, we say they're meat because we, they, they have a bridle. And, you know, Kentucky has the unbridled spirit, but yet when we put the, the bridle on the horse, it is now strength under control. And that is what meekness is. It is strength brought under control. Looking further into this, we see also, when we look at meekness, it has a development as we see these beatitudes. We've talked about this, how the sequence is the Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. First, you have to realize your brokenness in, in spirit. In that we have nothing to offer God, that spiritually we are bankrupt. None of us are righteous. I mean, there's people that walk around with self-righteous attitudes and thinking they're better than other people. And, and the church is no place where this is exempt from. I mean, in churches, you've often had people that were, you know, stuck up and snooty and would look down upon other people that didn't dress like them or live in the same neighborhoods as them or work jobs like them or act like them, you know, or talk like them. And it became almost a social club and not really a place where we're crying out and broken of our sins because reality is, you know, John the Baptist wore camel hair. I mean, well, how would we treat him if he came into our church today? I hope we would welcome him with loving arms. That we're a church that doesn't look on outer appearances, but we look at people's heart and not even seeing them where they are, but seeing them where they can become. And we welcome everybody in the church, no matter where they're from, no matter who they are. Because this is a place of healing. This is a place of redemption. This is a place of salvation. This is a place of grace. This is a place of love. This is a place of mercy. This is a place of forgiveness. But once we see that broken in spirit, and we see blessed are those that mourn. Because the reality is we should be mourning over our own sin. Mourning over the hurt that we see and mourning over people's trials and tribulations that they're enduring. Whether it's a physical storm of a hurricane that might be pounding down upon them or the knock of death that might be up on their door or loved ones from that of cancer. That we are a people that mourn that God would touch their lives. That we mourn for ourselves, but we mourn for those also around us. 
So how can we experience this? How can we go from the, the natural sequence of being broken in our spirit, being mournful to being meek? Well, I think there's a couple things we do, and I think just with three verses, I think there's three steps. And the first step, I think, is that we first have to submit ourselves to God. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I want you to take, pay attention to this key part right here, and it says this, Take my yoke upon ye and learn from me, for I am meek. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, an ox was a beast of burden. It meant that it carried the load. And I know that there's probably many of you out there that feel the burden of carrying your worries, carrying your concerns, carrying your anxiety, carrying, you know, the, 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 the doubt, carrying sometimes, you know, stress from other family members, carrying worry, carrying all these things that we carry in this world, and we do. And it hurts and it struggles, and that's why there's so much pain. But if you notice on here, he says, take my yoke upon you. And I want you to kind of get the image of this. Because sometimes we, you know, th this is something we don't really have many oxen out anymore today. So it's really something we need to, to kind of illustrate in our minds. Is that a yoke, you know, you mostly had two harnesses on these in which Jesus is describing. I mean, they're singles, but this is a double yoke. And there's one yoke in which you are in. But right beside you, equally yoked to you, is Jesus. Meaning that Jesus isn't taking the problems away. That's a, a major thing that sometimes a misnomer of Christianity. We think, well, man, once we get saved or, you know, we'll never have another problem, never have a difficulty, never have a situation in life. But that's not true. Because just because you're a Christian doesn't exempt you from experiencing the same pain, the same problem, same trouble this world does. The difference is that we're not alone. That as we carry these burdens, that we are yoked to Jesus. And Jesus is carrying the load with us. Matter of fact, he's carrying the load for us. And as we take his yoke upon us, it is no longer only us, but it is us and Jesus. But this only happens when we submit our lives to him. And the next thing that we do is not just submitting ourselves to God and Jesus Christ, but we have to also make sure that we respond to the word of God in our lives. Because once we say, God, I'm here, I'm submitting to you, whatever you say, whatever you ask, Lord, I'm doing. Lord, I am your servant. You are my Lord. Uh, God, you know, I, I thank you for saving me. But not only are you my Savior, but you're my Lord. That means you control my life. That we submit ourselves to the Word of God. You know, the Bible says this in the book of James. The brother of Jesus wrote, he said, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. Meekness is what able, enables us to be able to submit to the Word of God. That we understand that this Bible is the inspired Word of God. This Bible is not wrong. I mean, I may not understand this Bible. There's things in this Bible that isn't clear to me, but I do understand that everything in here is true. And when I come with a meek attitude toward the Word, and saying it with humility, welcoming the Word in my life. And I'm not just studying the Bible just to kind of parade it through the judgment bar of my mind, but I'm actually saying, God, I, I want you to speak to me through this Word. Uh, that, Lord, now I'm approaching this Word, and, and God, I ask you to use it a, 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 to quicken me, Lord, as a, as a sword to cut away that of not of you, and, Lord, shape my heart and mold me into your image. And there's sometimes there's things in here that says, you know what, I, I don't like that. But it isn't a matter if I like it. It isn't even a matter if I think, well, that's right or that's wrong or, or that's good, that's bad. That's not for me to decide. It's for me to say, God, this is what your word says. And Lord, in my meekness, I'm bringing strength under control. And I'm Lord, I'm going to change myself to match your word. I'm not going to change the word to match me. I'm going to change myself to match your word. You know, the Bible is not really meant to be interesting. It's meant to be disturbing. That when I open up this thing, I see how far off I am, and I say, man, I, my heart is disturbed. I need to change my ways. I, I need to, to, to walk in this. You know, because the Bible says that we are washed by the Word. 
You know, we are saved by the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus that redeems us. But then we're washed by the word, meaning cleansed. That means when I open up this word, God is cleansing me by showing me how to live. God's showing me his standard. God's showing me how to walk with him. God is sanctifying me by this word. God is washing me. God is allowing me to draw closer and closer to him and live a life that more solely reflects him because I've submitted myself to him and now I'm responding to him through his word. And then here's the next thing that we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. What does that mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? Well, it's actually one of the fruit of the Spirit. When I say fruit, we all know that. It is singular. It is not plural. There's not fruits. But there is the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, one of those fruit is this. It is meekness. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is meekness. When you say, Spirit of God, work in me. Spirit of God, use me. Spirit of God, do something in me. Then what it will do is it will begin to produce meekness. It is the fruit of the Spirit. We don't produce the fruit of the Spirit. Rather, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's not something we can sit here and we can, we can just concentrate enough on or we can push enough of or be determined enough of that now it's going to, you know, we're going to produce it. It doesn't work like that. We bear it because of the Holy Spirit in us, because we're submitted to Him, we're responding to the Word, and now we're being filled with the Spirit, so now we bear fruit. And fruit is the evidence that Jesus is in our life. And I think as Christians, we should be bearing fruit. I mean, if you have a tree that doesn't bear fruit, eventually cut it down. But I'm hoping and praying that we, as God says, you know, we'll give it another year, we'll fertilize, we'll water, that we are trees that will begin to bear fruit in our lives will be evidence of our walk that we, we give up the things of the world, as James said, the filthiness and lucre, and we allow ourselves to be filled with meekness, and that meekness causes us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then that allows us the love, peace, joy, hope, meekness to be able to flow through our lives, that when people encounter us, they say, you know, there's just something different about you. We are a peculiar people because we are a people that are filled with the Spirit. And it says this, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I mean, what a great inheritance that is. I, I remember I heard a story one time about a man who was reading the newspaper and it talking about Rockefeller died. And it was talking about the big inheritance uh, that, that one of his family members was going to get. And he was just sitting there crying. And a guy came up to him and said, Man, what are you crying about? He said, That don't have anything to do with you. He said, That's exactly what I'm crying about. I didn't get any of it. And that's a thing that we look at in the day. I mean, how great would it be to get an inheritance. But as believers, we have to learn to be meek, controlled by the Spirit to get our inheritance. We're meek, controlled by the Spirit, get the inheritance, because it says, blessed are the meek, for what shall they do? They shall inherit the earth. And this inheritance, most of it comes now. Matter of fact, Paul said in Corinthians, all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present things or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Therefore, we have a father that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, it's ours. But here's the thing about it. Here, here's the secret sauce, if you will be. No matter what you have in this world, if you have a trillion dollars, if you have homes and cars and properties and possessions and things, you will absolutely never enjoy it if you're not blessed because things do not bring happiness. Things cannot make you happy. But here's the other thing too. Just as things cannot make you happy, I don't care what you don't have. Because if you do have blessedness, then you have everything that you'll ever need. And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. And then he reminds us, and then the devil comes to you, and you know the devil will come, as either a roaring lion to terrify you, or an angel of light to entice you. And today, maybe you're at one of those crossroads. 
And I want to pray today that if you need today, you feel the burden in your heart, and you need to feel it lifted, that today would be the day that you come to Christ. That you would take upon His burden, you would take His yoke, and you would see His burden as light. And today you could cast all your cares upon Him and believe upon Him. And today maybe you've done that, but somewhere along the road, man, you, you walked away. You, you, you lost that peace that you're, you long for, but today God offers it back because there's grace. So today I want to invite you in a word of prayer. If you need to receive Jesus, here's the gospel in a nutshell. We're all sinners. Every one of us. None of us are righteous. We're all sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us needs saved. And that's a great thing. Well, the wages of sin of death, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And that's what he offers you today. If you'll believe upon him and you'll trust upon him and you'll call upon his name, today he'll save you. And if you need to be saved, join me in a prayer and say something like this. Say, Dear Jesus, I come today, confess that I'm a sinner. I ask for forgiveness of my sin. I believe that you are the Son of God that you died on a cross to save me and that you rose from that grave after three days. Jesus, I ask you to live in my heart and I thank you for saving me. And Lord, give me strength to make it public and Lord, the courage to walk it out. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you feel broken, worried, weak, or anxious, or maybe your load is just too heavy to carry, you don't know how much longer you can do it. Just like Pastor Cho said, you don't have to do it alone. If you come to God with honesty and give your problems over to Him, He will carry it for you. But don't take that as weakness. It's not weakness to admit that to God. He will give you strength. If you want to know more about God's love, you can text JC Save to 94090. And if you'd like to support the ministry here at Junction, you can give online at junctionchurch.ky through the mail or by dropping by the church office this week. We love you and we hope to see you next week.